is the uh, second message I'm giving with this title, Their Rock is Not Our Rock, a phrase that was taken from, or was taken from Deuteronomy chapter 32. And th this part is called the tongue. The tongue. And, and how does this play into why God did not leave one stone upon another? And how does it relate to our lives today? Uh, I want to start off this message, and I hope you don't mind uh, just giving a little bit of a, some, some personal information about me. Um, so I grew up in church, grew up a legalist, uh, dispensational, very uh, self-righteous, and uh, just a regular old pre-millennial Arminian. That's what I was. Pelagian almost, but I don't know. I don't know what was going on in my heart, but I knew that when I was 13, I attended this Christian camp and I fell under the conviction of sin and realized I needed a savior, but I didn't know what that looked like and I didn't know what grace was. And then all of a sudden I saw grace in undergraduate uh, when I attempted, my first attempt at seminary was Talbot in Southern California and an undergrad shared with me the doctrines of grace, specifically from Ephesians 1, just, just turned my whole world upside down. And uh, I eventually withdrew from seminary and wouldn't go back until 2011. So uh, it's kind of interesting. I, there was a preterist conference that I spoke at in, I don't know, I think it was around 2003 or 2002, and it was a pretty big one, I, you know, big for preterists anyway. I think there was probably about 150 people there, and I was invited to be a keynote speaker, right? Made me feel pretty good about myself, but I wasn't doing very well, um, and I actually was speaking on Hebrews 9 and 10, and about how the blood of Christ, the word of God says, I think it's uh, Hebrews 9, 14. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And it says that the animal sacrifices could never complete or perfect the conscience. Well, that's the story of the Bible, taking the conscience from innocent or from guilt to innocence. That's the story of the Bible. It's all about our conscience before the living God. It's the history of redemption. It's not the history of cosmology. And so I was teaching on that, and I was very, very uh, convicted and pierced by my own message. <laughs> and the truth is, is when I, when I do preach, it's, it's be, it's, what you're hearing is just a, a, a very... oh just a dude who's gone through a lot. And at that time, I was addicted to pornography. And I was speaking about the fact that we are cleansed by the blood of Christ. And my wife at the time, she was out there and her mom was there along with this 120, 130 people. And I was, I was very convicted because I was imploring them to be authentic. And so I share, I didn't know I was going to share this, by the way. You know how the Lord works sometimes. You know, you do all your study and all your preparation, and all of a sudden, God just lays something on your heart that you weren't planning on. And out of the blue, you know, this was a hidden thing in my heart. It was very unhealthy. It was, it was just very hidden in, in one of those skeletons. And one of the things I was sharing with our beloved sister, uh, we talk about skeletons in the closet, right? Well... I came up with this saying, maybe someone else has, but there is one skeleton that's never in the closet. And what is it? Gossip. gossip. Think about it. <laughs> You're letting everybody know when you gossip, right? It's not in your closet. The problem is we don't see it as a skeleton. And so anyway, I had this other skeleton, though, of pornography in, in my closet. Nobody knew about it. And I don't know what came over me, but I shared it with that entire group. 
that I was addicted to pornography. And it was actually a beautiful time. Because after that, I can't even tell you how many people were so gracious to stand up and come over and hug me and, and shake my hand. And, and the most beautiful thing happened that changed my ministry. Uh, the three guys came up to me and told me they were battling with the same addiction. Two of them were married. Um, ultimately, my marriage would end because of infidelity on my part. And it was, it was debilitating, it's tragic. And whatever I say up here, I never want you to get the idea that our disobedience does not have implications. And when I say that we rank sin, that's not to say that sin doesn't have different consequences. It does. For instance, before God, adultery in the heart is the same as outward adultery. Jesus was very clear on that. But outward adultery is going to ruin lives. It's going to ruin relationships. And so I have two boys. And it was hard to admit that to them. Because, you know, my dad hid all of his junk from me. So I just made a commitment. I'm not going to lie to my boys. I'm not going to pretend to be this godly preacher dad, right? I mean, you've heard of PKs, right? Preacher's kids. Well, I was the dad preacher, <laughs> the rebel going through so many struggles. And I'm so thrilled because now both my boys really love me. And we talk intimately about our struggles. And they know what dad has gone through. And so it's been beautiful. But during this message, as I speak, I might cry. I don't know. Uh, but I kind of relate to this woman who in Luke 7 was just crying before Jesus, weeping wiping his feet with her hair and her tears in this ointment. And I don't believe she was crying out of sorrow. I believe she was crying because at last this sinner knew the Savior had come to take away all her sins. She was filled with joy. And toward the end of that passage, Jesus says, you know, this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I got here. Simon, you Pharisee, you haven't even given me a glass of water. And then he goes on to say, the one who is forgiven little loves little. I don't think he was saying that some humans need only a little bit of forgiveness. I think what he's saying is those who don't believe they are sick, have no need of a physician. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. The people who admit, I'm broken and I have nothing before you. Or as the hymn says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And that's that woman. And she's weeping before Jesus. But I really believe it's tears of joy because she knew my sorrows at last will be taken away. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isaiah 53. There will be no more tears. We are living in that era now. There are no more tears. And you say, well, you lunkhead, why are you all up there shedding tears then? Yeah. I'm happy. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Right? His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. And he watches us with tender eyes. Not mean, scowling eyes. Not a frowning face. But that's the way I was raised. God was frowning on me in my sin. No, he's gentle. He's a loving father. He is a gardener. 
The Bible says in the New Kingdom, he waters his garden every moment. It's very beautiful, actually. So let's look at this topic of the tongue. Why did God not leave one stone upon another? First, as we saw last night, they denied their condition as sodomites. In other words, they denied that they were just as guilty as the people they were judging. The people they were pointing their finger at. The, the people that they were saying, stand by yourself, I'm holier than you. I can't believe you would commit that sin. How dare you? Right? Luke 18, verse 9, he spoke this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Whenever we rank sins, it is a philosophical certainty that you will judge others. When you place sins on different shelves, it is a philosophical certainty and biblical theological certainty or what we might say an anthropological certainty, that you will judge others. And we especially do it when we have not sinned in that particular area, right? How many of you, again, I asked this last conference when I was here, and by the way, just thank you so much for inviting me out. And one of the reasons I love Michael is because I can share anything with Michael. I can tell him anything about my life. And he still invites me. <laughs> he knows everything about me. And, uh, it, it, you know, and I, it, uh, again, full disclosure here. I talked about my drug addiction. And I don't know how many of you have ever struggled with opiates, but it is sort of a pill form of heroin. It's, that's really what it is. And it first started with morphine in 02. I got real sick and was in the hospital and just, you know, the little button you press when you're in pain. I was just doing that for three and a half weeks. I just had this horrible bacterial infection. And uh, shortly thereafter, or before that, it was actually <laughs> very shortly before that, my dad had passed away. And so everything was just coming crumbling down. And then during that time, I had had an affair. And, and, and so I experienced opiates for the first time. And if you've experienced opiates, you remember it. You never forget it. You never forget it. And the same is true with alcoholism. You never forget that. And these are things, you know, as talks about an elder, he must not be what? Addicted to wine. Given to wine. Proverbs 23 just lists these profound implications of being addicted to wine and then at the very end it says and when I awake I will seek another drink he that, that's what the alcoholic does he or she acknowledges all the pain and misery that alcoholism causes and then they still drink right Christians are dealing with this stuff Christians are dealing with addictions again not one is worse than another well I you know uh, back in July or June actually my mom on June 8th was in a terrible car accident horrible and she was hospitalized for two months she's 82 years old and I went down there and there was just you know family struggles and I fell off the wagon so hard at that house that dark house in Albuquerque New Mexico and I went back head over heels into alcohol and head over heels into opiates I searched around that house to drown my sorrows because my hero seemed to be dying. That's my mom. Prayed for me when I was growing up. And I had the privilege of sharing grace in the kingdom with her. What a blessing. But to think that she might pass away and all the family issues that were going on, I just had a meltdown. And that was that recent. So you are talking to a guy up here who just feels the joy of forgiveness, feels the joy of the kingdom, really experiences it. So understand that this passage right here was me. I despised others. And so I don't say anymore, I will never do such and such. 
because I always end up doing it. They separated themselves. Oh gosh, for those of you who have been in reform communities, we were the best at excommunications. I mean, we were excellent. We were experts at excommunication. God said, your hands are full of blood, Isaiah 115. What does this mean, full of blood? Well, yes, they were killing the prophets, but I think it has something, another meaning here that is maybe a little bit deeper that first starts with accusation. This was the iniquity of your sister Sodom, pride. And then at the very end, nor did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Who are the poor and needy? Again, I don't think this is a, a socioeconomic poverty. As Mike read, they stand by themselves. I'm holier than you. Did the Old Testament prophesy of the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple? Matthew 15, to the most outwardly righteous individuals, to darken the face of the earth. The Pharisees, hypocrites. What did Jesus say? Beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees, which is what? Hypocrisy. In other words, when we judge others, we do the same things. That's Romans 2 verse 1. That's true hypocrisy. And that's what the scribes and the Pharisees were guilty of. So, the question is, was the generation that crucified Jesus prophesied in the Old Testament? A specific, we say Jesus was prophesied, the kingdom was prophesied, but what about the very generation of the Pharisees and their wickedness and the level of their wickedness and their hatred that would bring the wrath of God to a culminating point to where he would pour it out full strength through the destruction of Jerusalem. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you. Now 700 years before. Saying this people draws near to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You know, your disciples. They haven't eaten, washing hands and all this stuff. Well, third, they had merciless tongues. The first two points we covered last night. They had merciless tongues. Leviticus, it starts. You know, one of the commandments in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not bear false witness, right? And we think, oh, that means lie. No, that's not what it's talking about. Now, do I believe that lying is profitable? No, of course not. We shouldn't lie one to another. But Rahab lied for a good reason, didn't she? She was protecting God's people. And God honored her and she was placed in the hall of faith. Hebrews 11. That's all we have about Rahab. She lied to protect God's people. It says, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. What are we dealing with there? We are talking, I believe, about a prophetic utterance. You shall not bear false witness against my people. You shall not falsely accuse them. You shall not go up and down as a talebearer among your people. A talebearer. These are false accusations, you'll see. Neither shall you stand against the blood of your neighbor. So when Jesus says, love your neighbor, he's saying, don't accuse them. Jesus said, as I have loved you, so love one another. Paul translates it this way. As Christ has forgiven you, so forgive one another. Don't come against your neighbor, against the blood of your neighbor. Do not accuse. He says, who shall lay a charge against God's elect? In Romans 8, God who justified you? Would God who declared you innocent by the blood of Christ ever bring an accusation against you? Of course not. 
So he's prophesying here. That's what it means. You shall not bear false witness. I really believe that. And the same is true with the, taking the name of the Lord in vain. Everybody says, oh, GD, you know, that's taking the name of the Lord in vain. No, Jesus just said, he said, in vain does this people worship me. They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That is worshiping God in vain. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. That is the true significance of that passage. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And that's what we're doing when we judge those whom Christ has cleansed. So here it is, a prophecy of the Pharisees. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. Most men, everyone will proclaim his own goodness, Proverbs says, and yet is not washed from their filth. This is prophetic because no one was washed from their filth in the Old Testament. That would not come until the blood of Christ. It is the blood of Jesus that washes people from their sins, as Revelation tells us. The Bible says in Zechariah, there should be a fountain opened up for sin and uncleanness in that day. That's the fountain of the blood of Jesus Christ. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. Amen? But this was not true of the Pharisees. They were pure in their own eyes. They were trusting their own righteousness and there's no washing in that. There is a generation, oh how lofty are their eyes, prideful, peering, trying to peer into your darkness, your sin, your wickedness, trying to find your skeletons and bring them out so everybody can see. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. When our brother or sister confesses to us, we cover them, we protect them, we tell them about the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how you restore them. You don't restore them by kicking them out. You restore them by saying, you know what? Let's pray together. Let's remind ourselves of the blood of Jesus. Let's remember his promises. Because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Do you always feel righteous? No, but God says you are righteous. Do you always feel joyful? No, but you are joyful. That's the kingdom joy. Do you always feel at peace? No, but his peace he gave us not as the world gives. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is an unbreakable, immutable peace. In spite of ourselves, again, Every one of us should wake up in the morning and say, thank you, God, for the cross. I'm still forgiven, even after last night. That doesn't say to me, oh, you have a license to sin. You know, I always get this accusation. I get it all the time. Oh, if you believe in that kind of grace, you must believe you can do anything you want. I say, that's not even a part of the picture. Because if you're washed in the blood of Christ, all you can think about is gratitude. All you can think about is, Lord, thank you. You know, some of these people say, well, you know, you just got to confess and, or else you're not forgiven. That's an old school, ancient church idea that arose after the first century. The Bible says he has forgiven us all trespasses. So maybe instead of saying, oh, Lord, will you forgive me? What if we say, Lord, thank you? What if you live in gratitude? What if you live in thankfulness to the Lord Jesus? That we are washed. How lofty are their eyes. And their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords. And their jaw teeth are like knives. To devour the poor from off the earth. What are the poor? Again, the ones who have been cast out because of sin. That was the biggest problem. That was God's biggest accusation against the Pharisees. Is they were always judging his people. And the needy from among men. They had merciless tongues. Proverbs 6. A worthless person. Listen to this. 
Listen to these six things. See if, see if all the sins you can imagine, the ones that we, maybe formerly, who were a part of the moral majority and the religious right, <laughs> I, call, I like to call it the religious wrong now, you know what I mean? It's like, oh my goodness. What kind of example are we setting? But watch, see if the sins that you once used to just despise and have contempt for, see if they're mentioned in here. And if they aren't, maybe, maybe, but yet you had those kind of rankings and thought of those things as so bad, right? Worse than others. If they aren't mentioned in here, reevaluate God's perspective. A worthless person, a wicked man walks with a crooked what? Mouth. A crooked mouth. Winking with his eyes, speaking with his feet, teaching with his fingers, perversity is in his heart. I believe this is a prophecy of the Pharisaic mentality. He is always planning mischief. Always lying in wait for blood, as Proverbs says. They're just waiting to find out the evil that you've done. He causes fighting. Boy, if we ask ourselves, what is the chief cause of division in churches? It's the tongue. It's gossip. Jesus said, just go to your brother. Go to him alone. Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. He is quickly broken. There is no healing. These six things the Lord, Yahweh, hates. Yes, seven are hateful to his soul. Are you ready? A proud look. Pride. Pride. Right? As we saw in Deuteronomy and Isaiah. A lying tongue. It's not just, you know, speaking about, oh, no, Dad, I didn't touch the cookie jar. It's not referring to that. The lying tongue is the false accusation against the people of God because that's the context here. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that plots wicked plans. Feet hurrying to run to evil. A false witness who speaks lies and he who causes fighting among brothers. Jesus spoke of the Pharisees as workers of iniquity. Have all the workers of iniquity not known eating up my people, fighting and devouring, accusing as they eat bread, they have not called on the Lord. In other words, they have not recognized they need mercy. Right? God be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, now the prophecy of protection and vengeance. And I encourage you, as you read the Psalms, to reevaluate the Psalms that are uttered in the first person singular, I. Read all the Psalms and import Christ in place of I. And it's life-changing. Life-changing. I'd say start with Psalm 69. Why? Because there are four, at least four passages in there that are uttered about Jesus Christ. And then look at the rest of it and say, wow, oh my gosh, that whole psalm is Jesus talking. I like to tell people, the Gospels give us the words of Christ about his ministry, during his ministry, and about the kingdom of God. The Psalms, are you ready? Give us the thoughts of Christ during his ministry and about his ministry and about the kingdom of God. The Gospels give us his actual words and actions. The Psalms give us his heart, the heart of Jesus. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye has become old with grief, my soul and my belly, for my life is ending with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity. You say, Christ's iniquity? Christ's iniquity? Did Christ sin? Well, no, the Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. 
but he became sin. He owned your sin. He owned it. He took my sins and my sorrows and made them his very own. Remember the hymn? Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Think about it. He took your sins, the God of glory, holy, 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 thrice holy, took your sins and said, I'm going to own them. I was a reproach among all my foes, but especially among my neighbors and a fear to my friends. Those who saw me outside fled from me. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel. I have heard the slander of many. Fear is on every side. Because of their plottings together against me, they planned to take away my life. But I trusted in you, O Yahweh. I said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Hallelujah. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies, the accusations, and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Amen. That's from the great benediction. That was a prophecy. Lord, cause your face to shine upon us. You know, so many of the mainline denominations quote that at the end, or what we call the benediction, right? They quote that as if it's not fulfilled. It is fulfilled. Thank you, Daniel, for that wonderful message. It's fulfilled. He is smiling. He is shining upon us now. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but have the what? Light of life. Make your face shine on your servant. So when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isaiah 59 was fulfilled on Jesus instead of the people of Israel. Behold, the Lord's hand is not heavy that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot, that, or, or shortened that it cannot save or hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and he has hidden his face from you. And Jesus, having existed with the Lord as the Lord himself, Yahweh, Christ, the wisdom and power of God, suddenly steps into this arena and takes your sin and takes Israel's sin as his own. And so the father's face, which was turned in the Old Testament away from the people because of sin, there was no access to the holiest of all. No one could enter into the holiest except Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And even then the high priest would go in and offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, Hebrews says. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, we enter, have entered into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus. And so what Jesus does is he steps out of the holiest of all, bears your sin, the Father turns his face from him. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he prays for deliverance and the father's face shines upon him as he ascends into the holy place and God the father accepts the sacrifice in the heavenlies. The Bible calls Jesus the mercy seat and now we have come to the mercy seat and it was at the mercy seat in the holiest of all where God said there Aaron I will commune with you. Commune. Commune. We're one with the Lord, not in deity, but in relationship as his bride. The two shall become 
one flesh. And that's why Ephesians 5, you know, we, we know the famous passage, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And then he goes on to say, this is a great mystery. And he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And he says, we are members of his flesh and of his bones. Isn't that wonderful? Make your face shine on your servants. Save me in your mercy. Let me not be ashamed. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, Christ despised the shame. For the joy set before him. That was you. Christ said, I will bear this shame. I despise it, but I will bear it because I want to be with her. I want to be with my people. I love them. I will go to the end for my people. I will lay aside my glory and become their sin and give them my holiness and my righteousness. It's marvelous. O Lord, for I have called on you, let the wicked be ashamed. The self-righteous, those trusting in themselves, the false accusers. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence. The lips which speak proudly against the righteous with pride and scorn. They accuse the righteous. That's the false accusation. Do you see that? Who shall lay a charge? You know, Jesus says now the prince of this world is cast out. The accuser of the brethren. You see that? How great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you. You have worked for those who trust in you before the sons of men. You shall hide them in the secrecy of your presence. What does Colossians say? Your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are in his presence. You are protected by him. No accusation has any effect whatsoever. They will bring up your past. Needless to say, I was not invited back to that conference. It's okay. I got Mike. <laughs> Mike, will you invite me next year? Oh, I, there was reluctance in that answer. <laughs> You shall hide them in the secrecy of your presence from the pride of man. You shall hide them in a shelter away from the strife of tongues. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Golly. And now watch, rather long passage, and we'll finish up with this one and one small verse at the end. And this, hopefully, will make sense of this whole issue as to, number one, why God destroyed the false accusers, the Pharisees. But then there's a beautiful outcome for you and me. Rejoice. Paul says this is fulfilled in Galatians 4 and 5. Rejoice, O oh unfruitful one that never bore. The Bible says Israel under law travailed and brought forth what? Wind. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you, you know, for you mothers, if you were pregnant for nine months and all of a sudden your water breaks and out comes psh, no baby. That's what Jesus was saying and the Bible was saying about Israel. She has labored and travailed and brought forth wind. No salvation, no fruit, no life. There's no life under the law. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Break out into a song and shout, you who never travailed, for more are the sons of the desolate than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Comparing Israel and Judah. Make the place of your tent larger. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. These are the open gates, including all nations. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. This is a big old tent. He's making an allusion to the tabernacle, right? The moving tabernacle, the mobile tabernacle, the Coleman tent. <laughs> Lengthen the cords, strengthen your stakes, 
For you shall break out on the right hand and on the left, and your seed shall inherit the nations. Isn't that a beautiful prophecy of us? And people will inhabit ruined cities. That's Amos 9 compared with Acts 15. And it's the waste places that through the gospel, God has restored that breach of David. Okay? Do not fear, for you shall not be ashamed. The Bible says whoever believes on him will not be ashamed. There's no more shame. How often though I've woken up the next morning and felt ashamed. And then I've gone to the scripture and God says, you're not ashamed. You're cleansed. You're going to struggle with implications for what happened last night. Definitely. And it's going to hurt. There's going to be some chastisement. But in my eyes, you're not ashamed. I think we are our worst critics sometimes. Do not fear, you shall not be ashamed, nor shall you blush. Right? Blush, being found out, your scandal. What's your scandal? Just ask yourself, what scandal is in your life right now that's causing you to feel shame? Understand, no scandal can remove the cleanliness and holiness and righteousness of the robes of Jesus Christ. No scandal. Nothing in your life. Whatever you're going through right now, in the eyes of God, you're not ashamed. You're not blushing. For you shall not be put to shame. You shall not... You shall forget the shame of your youth and shall not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. Of course, speaking of the northern kingdom. Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord has called you as a woman forsaken, grieved in spirit, a wife of youth when you were rejected, says your God. For a little moment I left you. But with great mercies I will gather you. In a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 31, I have drawn you with cords of loving kindness. I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah for me. For as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn from being angry with you and from rebuking you. You know what Hebrews says? The Bible says, God swore by himself because he could swear by no greater. I always tell people, God said, I swear to me. I swear to me. I will never be angry with you. I swear to myself, because I can't swear by any greater, I will never rebuke you. What does that remind you of? Colossians 1. You are holy and without blame and without reproof in his eyes. For the mountains shall depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness will never depart from you. Nor shall the covenant of my peace, Ezekiel chapter 37, says it's an everlasting covenant of peace. And Hebrews chapter 13 says, now may the God of peace through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Says the Lord who has mercy on you, afflicted one, storm tossed, not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones among antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. This is the building of the church, right? The Bible says in Peter, he said, you are living stones, right? Galatians, or Revelation speaks of the church as being built up of all these different stones. That's the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, adorned as a bride coming down from heaven, from God. That's us. We're adorned. That's our clothing in the righteousness of Jesus. And I will make your battlements of ruby and your gates of carbuncles and all your borders of pleasant stones. And all your sons shall be taught of the Lord. Hebrews 8. He says of the new covenant, and they shall all be taught of God. 
And great shall be the peace of your sons. Again, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In righteousness shall you be established. As Daniel said, the righteousness of Christ, not our righteousness. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror it shall not come near you. No more accusations. Behold, they shall surely gather together. We see it all the time, right? When we fall or people bring up our past, we feel it, they're gathering, but watch what he says. Behold, they will surely gather together, but not by me. Whoever shall gather against you, he shall fall by you. You say, what? He shall fall by you? What does that mean? You mean I get to jack these suckers up? How dare you bring up my past? I remember what you did, right? Isn't that the first thing we do? Man, that's my nature. When people sit to bring up something about me, I'm like, well, what about you? That's my nature. Rather, our best response is coming. Here's, our, here's the best response. Here is the biblical and victorious response you give to those who accuse you and you give to yourself when you're accusing yourself. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the coals in the fire and who brings out a tool for his work. I've created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against you shall be blessed. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. What does that mean? So they say something about our past and we say, go to hell. No. No, 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 no. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. When they say that, our response is, I am clean by the blood of Christ. I regret what I did, but I'm clean. When you preach the gospel, this is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me. The blood of Jesus says the Lord. And then finally, the fulfillment of protection and vengeance. Revelation 12, verse 10. Are you ready for this? This is so beautiful. And I heard a great voice in heaven. Now has come the salvation, resurrection, life eternal, and power, power of the gospel, and the kingdom of our God. Now watch. And the authority of of his Christ. 2 Corinthians 2. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. That's the victorious gospel. We never lose when we tell people, I'm cleansed by the blood of Christ. That's the gospel. For the accuser of our brothers is cast down, the Pharisees, the snakes, those who accuse them before our God, day and night, wickedness in heavenly places. Satan is gone, amen? You say, wait, they still accuse me. It's gone from you. You are victorious. You have overcome them by the blood of the Lamb. You're holy and righteous in His eyes. And you're going to hear a lot of accusations because you're going to blow it a lot in this life. I am too. And we are called to love one another in spite of ourselves and see us as God sees us, children of the living God, holy and righteous in His eyes, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, the heritage that we have as servants of the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against you will prosper. No one can lay a charge against you. You won't lose your salvation. You won't lose your forgiveness. You won't lose your white robe because the righteousness is of me, God says. Amen? All right, thank you for allowing me to teach these two messages. And I hope that it took a turn from maybe, you know, a feeling of somewhat uh, of a dismal message last night. But I, I, I wanted to kind of paint the picture. And I feel sorry for the people that weren't able to show up today because, man, they probably feel bad. But I don't want you to feel bad. I want you to feel encouraged and rejoice in this beautiful kingdom. When you're going through tough times, this stuff is super relevant to us.
Okay? So God bless you.